Hey, hey guys, welcome to basic chemistry. Ah, I'm so excited that you're in this class. Um, my name is Keegan Gold. I'm going to be your instructor. Um, we're going to kind of start right off the bat with this is uh, chapter two information, but I do expect you to read chapter one. The reason I want you to read is uh, two reasons. One, I think it's important that you get used to reading in college. Um, and two, it really will help you uh, get a better understanding of the foundation of the class and and things that uh, we'll be referring to, like molecule, atom, element, etc. If you have any questions regarding anything, um, I'm available via the discussion board, which is I prefer um, because per the syllabus, I like to answer a question and then have everybody else be able to uh, see that answer because they usually have the same question that you do. Um, uh, I'm available via email, so you can email me. You also have two TAs, which will be starting in the next uh, week or two, and you'll be able to email them with questions as well. And finally, uh, you can get a hold of me during office hours. I don't have office hours my first week of class. Um, that's generally what I do, but also I don't have any childcare right now. So uh, unless you feel like watching, a, a, well, they're pretty cute, a four-year-old and a six-year-old run around, um, it's probably best we don't have office hours the first week. The next week I will be set and we'll have some time to, to uh, do Zoom office hours. Those hours are available on the syllabus. All right, another thing I should probably talk about, the, my hands. So I'm, I'm I'm a mess. I paint a lot. Um, pretty much my biggest hobby is is refurbishing things and doing fun things like that, or or working on my house. So I will always have different colored paint on my hand. So today was black, and I'm I'm sorry for that. Um, it looks pretty gross, but it's it's just it's paint. I promise. Okay, moving on. We're gonna start with chapter two. So in chapter two, um, it's it's important to understand the difference between accuracy and precision, and that will be a common concept in your chemistry career. So you'll see it come up a lot. So let's go ahead and give an example of the difference. So let's say you have a roommate, and you're gonna shoot an apple off of your roommate's uh, head. All right, so there's your roommate. Let's say she's female and she's scared. She's like, no, don't shoot that apple off my head. Okay, and you come around and you're like, that's cool, I got this. I got a bow and arrow and I'm taking bow and arrow archery 101 and I can do this. And so you go to shoot the arrow off of her head and you shoot the arrow right here. Was that accurate? Chances are you're gonna say, no, that wasn't accurate. And you'd be absolutely right. If you're especially considering your goal is the apple. So accuracy, Accuracy, I can write it, refers to how close a measurement, or in this case, a shooting of an arrow, is to the actual value. In other words, if you go stand on a scale, and let's say you're 175 pounds, and you stand on the scale, and the scale says that you are 175 pounds, that is an accurate scale. All right, um, not to be confused with precision, which is actually quite different. So precision, you need more than one data point to tell you whether or not something is precise. So if I shoot again, and I shoot over here, and then one more time, and I get right here, all three of those ended up in the same general area. That's precision. Precision is how close measurements are to each other. If they're really close, they're highly precise. So precision is how close measurements are to each other. Accuracy is how close measurement is to the actual value. So let's give another example, uh, or we'll keep the same example. We'll draw the same person. Now the apple looks like a heart, it's organic. And we'll put her right here. She's still screaming, ah, her ear just messed up. I don't know what happened to her poor ear. And um, somebody goes and shoots, you go to shoot the arrow and you get here, here, and maybe over here. That is not precise. However, you could almost argue that it's accurate, but the average of all those values ends up over here, so it's not exactly accurate. All right, so it's neither accurate nor precise. Okay, but there is a difference between these two. 
and one is fixable and one is not. What I mean by that is, um, if if you keep if you keep shooting over and to, to the right of where you want to shoot, then you just move your bow and arrow to the left, right? So you could actually move it over a little bit and it would be fine. In other words, all of these uh, airs, all of these shots fell to the right, every single one of them. And if they all fall to the right, that means you can adjust it by moving it to the left. It also means that there's a system to what you're doing. You keep accidentally shooting over to the right. And if you keep accidentally shooting over to the right, that system, is pointing out that you have an error in every single shot. So, systematic error is essentially consistent error. Consistent error. It's error where you do the same thing over and over again, and it can be fixed. For example, if you weigh 175 pounds, you hop on the scale, and it says 180, well, but you know that you're 175, then you would just simply subtract five pounds from whatever value you have here. It's a system that you can fix. So systematic error is consistent error that can be fixed, as opposed to random error. As uh, seen here, where it's all over the place. There's not one single thing you can do to all these shots is going to fix them. Um, random error can't be fixed. It's inconsistent. And it can't be fixed. After the fact, of course, you can find out what might be causing that, or it's usually user error or something that affects, but the random error is, is not one thing that you can fix easily. All right, so once we have an idea of those, um, we're actually gonna move on to a totally, what's gonna feel like a totally random topic. Scientific notation. But once we understand scientific notation, we can learn the rest of these concepts very easily. Okay, so the reason we use scientific notation is that in science, we have really big numbers, and small numbers. And those can get really annoying to write. And I'll do this probably in the next lecture or two, but for example, uh, some of you have maybe heard of a mole. That's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd things. Um, don't worry, this is not your lecture on mole. I'll make it a whole lot less scary. But one thing to think about is this number is this big. So imagine if we went around what, writing numbers that were this big in chemistry or in, in physics too, uses really big and really small numbers, it would get pretty annoying. So we use scientific notation. Scientific notation does a couple things. Um, first, it simplifies the numbers. First, it simplifies numbers. Two, it makes them comparable, comparable. You can look at them and see, um, hey, if this one's times 10 to the 23rd and this one's times 10 to the 20, this is 10 to the third times bigger than this one. Uh, another thing is uh, you can see or can easily determine significant figures. And we'll talk about significant figures in this lecture as well. Okay, so how you put numbers in scientific notation? Well, for numbers with a magnitude greater than one, so for example, uh, if you have 87, I think you'll agree that's a number greater than one, you put this in scientific notation uh, by simply looking at it, knowing where the decimal would be, and moving that decimal and counting the number of times we moved it. So for example, I went from here to here, I moved it one time. This would then be 8.7, we look at where we move the decimal, times 10 
to the number of times we moved it. So let me give you lots of examples to make sure you understand that. But another way to do it is after we've done this, let's go back and see if it makes sense. If I took 8.7 and multiplied it times 10 to the 1, that's a 1 with 1 0, it would equal 87. All right, so let's do a different number. Let's say you have 4,572, and you want to put that in scientific notation. Well, we take the decimal that would be right here. We move it between the first and second non-zero numbers. So we move it one, two, three times, and this number would be 4.572 times 10 to the third. You could check it and see if that makes sense. 10 to the third is the same as a one with three zeros, that's a thousand. So it was 4.572 times a thousand equal to 4,573, it is. So scientific notation is just another way of representing the number. It's gonna be the same number. You should be able to go back and forth and not lose any information between here and here. Oops, I got it. <laughs> I bet some of you are pretty mad right now. Let's make that the two. So you can do this without losing any information at all, and that's how you know that you did it correctly. If you lose information, something went wrong. All right, let's do uh, one more final example, 45,612, and I want to put that number in scientific notation. You start with where the decimal is, and you always move it between the first and second number, the first and second uh, non-zero number. First and second non-zero number are this four and five. So I'm going to take the decimal here. I'm going to move it one, two, three, four times. I write that number out here, 4.5612 times 10 to the 4. And this is my answer in scientific notation. Now, if I want to check to make sure, I say, hey, is this number times 10 to the 4, which is a 1 with four zeros, is this times that equal to 45? 612, and it is. So this is how you do numbers that are greater than 1. All right, um, so make sure you practice. Try to go back and forth. Use this scientific notation and see if you can go from, for example, this to there, which kind of we, we did. We went to scientific notation and out of scientific notation. Now let's look at numbers um, with magnitudes that are between 0 and 1. In other words, uh, decimals. That's not to negate... Um, I should probably add one more example here. That's not to negate um, negative numbers. So oftentimes people get scared with negative numbers. Let's do a negative number real quick. Negative 5,372. Okay, and this negative 5,372, the magnitude of it, the absolute value of it is still 5,372, right? So we're still going to use the same process. This is equal to, take the decimal, move it one, two, three times to be between the first and second number, and I get negative 5.372 times 10 to the third. You could check it out. You could put in your calculator five, negative 5.372 times 10 to the third, which is also equal to a one with three zeros or a thousand, and you'd get negative 5,372. But when I'm talking about decimals, what I mean is you have a zero point something. So 0 0.519. Now in this case, you have a number between 0 and 1. And all you should be paying attention to is, is moving the decimal again between the first and second number. But you'll notice that you moved it a different way. So this would be equal to 5.19 times 10 to the negative number of times you moved it to the negative one. Now you can put this in your calculator, 5.19 times 10 to the negative one, which would also be equal to 5.19 times 10 to the 0 0.1. And you would find out that that in fact does equal 0 0.519. And you'd get it back. Let's go a little crazy here. Let's say we got 0 0.0007318. In this situation, you've got a decimal here. Same thing, you move it between the first and second non-zero number. One, 
two, three, four times, which would be equal to 7.318 times 10 to the negative four times. Again, one, two, three, four. You can check in your calculator and make sure that works. Take 7.318 times 10 to, the, 10 to the negative four, which is also equal to 0 0.0001. And you would in fact find out that it equals 0 0.0007318 and you would be all set. All right, so numbers with magnitude greater than one, you're just gonna have a positive exponent. Numbers with magnitude that are between zero and one, you'll have a negative exponent. So make sure you understand those two differences. One of the biggest things, uh, biggest issues that I see students have is they never get this concept and it's just gonna continue to build. So if you didn't understand this, in fact, even if you did understand this, pause it, test yourself. Let's do it, let's do a, a quick lesson. So. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll write two numbers. Uh, one is 243. The other 0.00243. And go ahead and tell me what each of these would be in scientific notation. So pause it. Hopefully you paused it and you didn't just assume that you knew it because the biggest mistake that students make is assuming that they know something when they really don't. So um, you still have a chance to pause it. All right, so what you're going to do is look for the decimal place where it should be. It's right here. And move it between the first and second number. So this would be 2.43. We moved it one, two times. And that would be our answer. 2.43 times 10 to the 2 is our answer in scientific notation. All right, move on to this one. Same exact situation, we want to move it between the first and second number. We moved it three times, but keep note that this is a decimal. We moved it the opposite direction. So this would be 2.43 times 10 to the negative third. All right, so I hope that helped. I'm going to move on to six figs. Okay. Significant figures are called significant for a reason. They're really, really important. Um, significant figures essentially tell you the precision of a measurement. They let you know if the instrumentation that you're using um, it is essentially good or not. So let's, let me give you an example. Let's say you have a container like this. And it's got between zero, let's make it a little bigger, zero and 10 labeled, but nothing else. And I said, hey, how much is in this? Um, you couldn't accurately look at this and be like, oh, it's 5.431623 milliliters. You wouldn't be able to do that at all. So instead, uh, what you do is you take your best guess, right? Uh, most of you probably naturally said five, maybe some of you said four, maybe some of you said six. I'm gonna say about five, whatever it is, milliliters or gallons, I don't know. Okay, and uh, let's add another graduation mark that to that though. Same container, we got zero to 10. But now all of a sudden we also have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the line's exactly the same. Right there. Well, now again, this is one, two, three, four, five, six. And now you're looking at it and now you can say, hey, it's somewhere between five and six. It looks like it's maybe a little bit closer to five. So you might guess that's 5.4. All right, let's do another one. Let's go a little crazier here. Same thing, zero to 10. I understand that the container size is changing every time. That's why I was not an art major. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
Okay. But now we go one, two, three, four, five. I'll put a five here and a six here. And imagine there's 10 marks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And again, I draw a line. Well, if you were to zoom in on this, you'd be able to say, in fact, let's pretend that we're doing that. Five. So let's zoom in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you zoomed in and you found it to be right here. This was 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4. So it's somewhere between 5.3 and 5.4. It looks to me like it's closer to 5.4. I would say that's about 5.38. All right, so my overall point here is as you add graduation marks, what's happening to your number? It's getting smaller and smaller, right? Like the details that we know about it are getting greater. It's going from five to 5.4 to 5.38. We're adding a decimal every single time. This one has more sig figs because we know more about that number as opposed to this one, which has less because we know very little about that number. Now, exactly how much we know is um, pretty important. So let me give you a brief breakdown of what this means. So if we have a number that is five, a measurement that is five, we actually know between plus and minus one of the last significant number. So this actually equals four, somewhere between four and six. 5 minus 1 is 4. 5 plus 1 is 6. All right, let's look at this 5.4. What is 5.4 telling us? It's not telling us anything's exactly 5.4, though I'll ask you that in a test. Hint, hint. What it is, as we look at the last significant number, that's the 0.4 here, we subtract 1 from that, we add 1 to that, and this is a range between 5.3 to 5.5. All right, we do the same thing over here, 5.38. You look at the last number, that's this one. You add one, you subtract one, and that will give you a range, 5.37 to 5.39. In other words, if you give somebody a shot that has 5.38 cc's, it's really somewhere between 5.37 and 5.39. It's not exactly 5.38, and you wouldn't be able to tell that. And that's why over here, some people might have said, hey, no, that's actually four, or hey, no, that's actually six, and you guys would all be right. It's between a range of four to six. It covers the fact that humans have air, and we don't understand everything either. We can't see things perfectly either. This 5.4, some of you might have said, no, it's 5.5. You would have been right. Somebody said 5.3. You are right. It's between 5.3 and 5.5, etc. All right, so what becomes necessary to understand? Take another side note. Is when we have exactly a certain amount. So let's say it's zero to 10 here. And let's say you said, hey, that's two. And you got another one, zero to 10. Then you would look at this and you wouldn't say it's just two. You know that when you added graduation marks, you had to add an extra decimal. This is no longer two, it's 2.0. Let's do it one more time, make it even crazier. And say there were nine hash marks between each of these for the point, point one level. 
And you would look at that and you'd say, hey, that's actually 2.00. So this is really important to understand that there's a huge difference between 2, 2.0, and 2.00. Which one would you rather have injected in you? A range that's between 1 and 3, or a range that's between 1.99 to 2.01? Hopefully you chose this one. And that's why these numbers become very important. In other words, they're very significant um, in, in understanding how measurements work. All right, so in order to really understand everything, we gotta learn some rules first. So all non-zero numbers are significant. So if you're counting out the number of sig figs something has, if it's, uh, let's say it's four, so 475, this would have three sig figs. I'll often denote significant figures as SF. Significant, I can do it. Figures. If I have a number that's 53,780, that would have, oh, let me not do 80. Who's doing 80? Let's do this all over again. 53,588. This would be five significant figures because each of these is non-zero. One, two, three, four, five. If you did 2,000,000, 738,346. This would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven significant figures in it. Okay, the next rule is that all zeros between numbers are significant. In other words, if you have 403, this has one, two, three significant figures. And this counts for decimals too. Oftentimes a counter example somebody will give is what about like 40.018. That's got one, two, three, four, five. Because those zeros fall between the four and the one. As long as they're sandwiched somewhere between a number, it doesn't matter if there's a decimal anywhere there, it's going to be significant. Let me give you one more counter example. 22.01. That zero is sandwiched between a two and the one, and therefore all those are significant. This would be four significant figures. All right, zeros before numbers are not significant. So for example, 0 0.00316 only has three sig figs. All of these numbers are not significant. One very quick way to determine that is actually put the number in scientific notation. So if we took this 0 0.00316 and put it in scientific notation, that would be 3.16 times 10 to the negative third. And you should be like getting like that on those. This only has one, two, three numbers. Therefore, it only has three sig figs. So you can put in scientific notation. I used to put psi not, but that's a bad idea. Everybody's like, why do you keep telling us not to? Yeah, um, the things you learn. Okay, so you can put that in scientific notation um, to help visualize. Okay, another example of, of zeros before numbers, if you've ever sat there in your calculator and put a whole bunch of zeros, like zero, 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 just for fun, and then you're like 21, guess what? Your calculator will only say 21 because it knows that those zeros aren't significant and they don't matter. Um, then you end up with two sig figs. And I should be careful with what I just said because these numbers are placeholders. They matter, right? But they're not significant figures. They don't tell you. Um, much else about the measurement other than uh, other than their placeholders. Okay, so here again, you could put this in scientific notation. Uh, this would be two point one times ten to the one because it's not a decimal. All right, then we get somewhere which uh, which I'd really like if if you were to practice this a few times because this tends to be the most confusing part that ends up getting people on the final exam and every exam kind of in between. It's just something that, that uh, you don't like, but we've already proven it here. As we added zeros to this thing, it got more significant, right? This one had one sig fig, this had two, this had three. But there are cases 
where zeros are not significant as, as here. If you have a measurement with a decimal somewhere in there and they come after a number, they are significant. Significant. We'll see if I fix this before I post it. Let's give you some examples. If you have a number like this, um, 200.0. Do these zeros come after a number? Yes. Is there a decimal somewhere in that number? Yes. Therefore, they are significant. This is four sig figs. Let's do another one. Three thousand. Now, if you look at three thousand, you want to say it's got four, but is there a decimal in there? No, it only has one significant figure. Let's look at um, another example. What if you have zero point oh oh three eight zero? Well, we know zeros before are not significant. But this zero comes after a number and there's a decimal in there and therefore this has three sig figs. All right. So I kind of want to blow your mind a little bit here. So let's do it. Um, let's look at the following number. Let's, let's go ahead and take our 3,000, actually. That would be pretty fun. Okay, so if we got 3,000, and it's got just one sig fig, we know that the first significant figure, or the last significant figure, I should say, we add one, subtract one, and that gives us a range. In other words, the range here is between 2,000 to 4,000. We added one, we subtracted one from that first, or the last significant figure. And if we want to make it four sig figs, we could do that. Um, we know that zeros that come after numbers, as long as there's a decimal in that number, are significant. So all we need to do is actually add a decimal. And boom, shakalaka, this thing's got four sig figs. And now our last significant figure is this one right there, the very last one. Because all of those are significant. We add one, we subtract one, you get a range of 2,999 to 3,001. But what about, what if I want to write one with two sig figs or three sig figs? How do you do that? You can't using standard notation. You have to use significant no or scientific notation. And that's why it's really, really important. So if we want to write these in scientific notation, the only way to do two sig figs or three sig figs is to write 3.0 times 10 to the third or 3.00 times 10 to the third. This 3.0 times 10 to the third would give me a range between plus or minus one of this number here. In other words, 2,900 to 3,100. And this one is in the tens place. This would give me a range between 2,990 to 3,010. And this would be my range or my actual value of that measurement. So there's a huge difference between 3,000, 3,000, and 3,000 point, And those zeros are really important to understand. So the reason I really like recorded lectures is because now you can stop, you can rewatch it, and you can make sure you have a very strong understanding of what's going on here. The book teaches the exact same way that I teach, um, and there's videos in there also to help you. But if you have any questions, don't don't hesitate to, to holler at me. And again, I prefer the discussion board, but I, I will answer emails also very quickly. So yeah, pause it, go over it, make sure you really, 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 really understand it. And then we'll test ourselves in the next video. All right, so the next page says, how many sig figs are in the following? So this first one, uh, I got uh, one, two, three, four, five non-zero numbers. So five. 
The next one I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. That zero comes between sandwiched between two numbers, so it's significant. So that's significant. This next one, these first three zeros don't uh, don't have any number before them, so they they come before a number. Any zeros that come before a number are not significant. So do, 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 sound effects included, and we get five. All right, the next example. Um, these two before won't count. Booga booga. And we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do these zeros count at the end? They do because they come because they come after a number and there's a decimal somewhere in that number. So again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Would be your answer for that one. The next one, uh, fourteen thousand five twenty. This zero, although it comes after a number, there's no decimal in that number. So this only has four sig figs. And this one does have a decimal, so that zero is now significant, and there are five. Okay, now we get into rules for multiplication and division. So significant figures end up being really important because they teach us about, um, they, they allow us to calculate how uh, accurate a measurement is throughout an experiment. So, um, for example, if you're looking at your Apple Watch or your phone or whatever, and you go for a run, that run will probably say you ran, maybe, let's say you run like 1.4 miles. It would not say you ran 1.3978462 miles, which might be what you ran, but it has no way of actually calculating that. And so it says, hey, this is the best I can do, one decimal place, 1.4 is what you ran. This, it cannot do. It's just way too accurate for it, and eventually you get down to the to the molecules on your b body size, and you can't do that. Okay, so let me tell you a story for multiplication division before we get in it. Let's say, in fact, I should use some paper here. My kids are really into finding rocks, so let's say my kid goes out in the yard, and he's like, Mommy, I found this rock. He calls everything a geode, um, and when they're not geodes, but it's so cool. So um, we still smash them open. All right, so you've got this rock, and you want to know its density. All right, density equals mass over volume. You've probably been taught that with a triangle with songs with everything you could possibly think of um, but ultimately what I like to memorize density as uh, for now is that it's in grams per milliliter or grams per centimeter cubed. Why I like to do that is because this automatically without any um, equation at all tells you what you need. It tells you that you need to take the grams and divide them by the milliliters and that will give you the density or the grams and divide it by the centimeters cubed that's the area of of the rock okay so let's take care of volume first now you can't take length times width times height to get an accurate centimeters cubed but what you can do to find volume is you can put it in water if you ever hop in a bathtub your water goes up um, it displaces by the volume that you are so let's say you have this rock and you put it in here I'm trying to make it look the same it goes from here to here and I'm not going to say what the difference is, but let's say the difference is like 2.1 uh, milliliters. So what that tells you is that the volume of this rock is 2.1 milliliters. Again, you put it in the water, the water level went up by 2.1 milliliters. All right, so now you know the milliliters. So you got grams over 2.1 milliliters. So now you just need the mass. So you go to your kitchen scale, you're like, all right, kitchen scale, tell me what this rock is in terms of mass. And it says, hey, the rock is 8.43 grams. 
and you're like, sweet. So my density is 8.43 grams divided by 2.1 milliliters. And then let me get a calculator out. 8.43 divided by 2.1. And I get an answer of 4.042857 grams per milliliter. And that tells you the density of the rock. But you're like, no, no, no. I can do better than that. So you call up your good buddies at NASA who have a really, really, really cool scale. And they take that rock and they find that the measurement is 8.43, good job on your kitchen scale, 16221 grams. Mind blown. Super cool scale. Okay, so your density over here, again, was this. But now let's go ahead and calculate, well, I'll draw a little arrow to make sure we keep all track of it. But the density over on this one is going to be equal to our 8.4316221 grams divided by that 2.1 milliliters. 8.43. One six two two one divided by two point one, and here I get an answer of four point zero one five zero five eight one grams per milliliter. And I say great. Which one do you trust more, this one or this one? The vast majority of you are probably saying this one because it makes the most intuitive sense, right? This one was obviously had a higher, higher precision. We knew all the way down to this place. So therefore we should know more about this value. But first we have to look at rules of multiplication and division to make sure we understand why that's actually not the case. So multiplication division, your answer, I don't know why I'm doing all this. There we go. Your answer, So when you multiply and you divide, your answer should have the same number of sig figs as the number with least amount of sig figs. in your calculation. What do I mean by that? I mean this. We did two calculations and I'm gonna rewrite them to make sure they're really, really clear. We did the first one, which is 8.43 grams divided by 2.1 milliliters. This had how many sig figs? This one had three. This one, had two. I'll write SF just in case. So our answer, though it ended up being 4.0142857, can only have the same number of sig figs as the one with the least, two. So what you'd do is you'd look at this number, you'd underline it up to two sig figs. You'd ask if this number is five or greater, because if it's five or greater, you're going to round up. But in this case, you don't have to. You just truncate it. You get rid of it. Our answer is actually 4.0 grams per milliliter because that has two sig figs, which is the same as this one over here. So they match. As opposed to this one up here, where we had 8.4316221 grams, and we divide it by, by 2.1 milliliters. Here we got the answer of 4.015051, which is cool. But this one had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sig figs. Ah, but this one still only had two sig figs. So how many should my final answer have? Two. Highlight up to the 
second sig fig, ask if the number next to it's five or greater. If it is, you'd round up. It's not, so we truncate it. Our answer is simply 4.0 grams per milliliter. You get the exact same answer, no matter what, because this 2.1 only had two sig figs, and it is the one that controlled everything. So did it matter that you sent it to NASA? Not at all. Your answer can only be as precise as the one with the least precise um, measurement. All right. So whenever you do multiplication and division, that's what you end up getting. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and talk about addition and subtraction now in terms of significant figures. Uh, if it looked like I disappeared for a little bit or like the camera flipped or whatever it, it did, I went and grabbed some grub because I'm pretty sure y'all could hear my stomach rumbling. So I'm good now. I got an extra veg or a veggie sandwich with extra pickles and I'm feeling pretty rad. So let's talk about addition and subtraction rules with sig figs. If you have a container like doo -doo -doo -doo, that and it goes zero to ten, and you've got somewhere in there. And I say, how much is in there? You might say, that's kind of hard, two or three. I'm gonna go with, uh, let's say, three. And you've got another container over here. And we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And this one's somewhere around here. You'd probably say that's like, I don't know. 3.6, 3.7. And you take this container and you throw it in there. How much is in there? Well, you were probably really tempted to say, hey, it's 3 plus 3.7. Last I looked, that's 6.7. And that would be your answer. But that is not your answer. Why? Because if I take this amount and I pour it into here, do we really know what's in there? let me ask you this how much exactly is in this one is it three is it 3.0 could it be 3.1 could it be 2.8 yeah it could be a range between two and four because we already discussed that it's plus one or minus one so it's somewhere in this range we have no idea exactly how much is in there so if we have no idea exactly how much is in here and we take this and pour it into there we still have no idea exactly how much is in there. So we're taking three point something, we got no idea, adding it to 3.7, we can't with any certainty say that this is actually 6.7. You can't, you have no idea what those numbers or these decimals are. And so to factor this in, we have a rule that we follow for addition and subtraction. And that rule is this. Your answer can only be as precise as the measurement with the least amount of precision. In your calculation. Let me say that again. Your answer can only be as precise as the measurement with the least precision in you, in your calculation. All right, now we've got some examples coming up. So I'm just gonna go ahead. Actually, I'm gonna do one or two examples first to make sure we're on the same page. All right, so if you've got something like 432.1 and you add 1.1376 to it. Now technically you would normally go from right to left. You'd say that's 6, 7, 3, that's 2.334. So your answer would be 433.2376. But again, your answer can only be as precise as the measurement with the least precision in your calculation. What I mean by precision is going from left to right, which one do you know the most about the number going farthest to the right? You know the most about this one and the least about this one. 
this one goes all the way to the ones that are the excuse me the tenths hundredths thousandths ten thousandths place and this one only goes to the tenths place this one is least precise this whole number is the least precise number and this answer must match that precision this one went to the tenths place Therefore, this answer can only go to the tenths place. So you underline up to the tenths place. You ask if the number next to it is a five or greater. It is not. So therefore, you truncate it. Our answer is actually 433.2. Again, because this was the tenths place. In case, maybe I should have done this. Um, 1433.2. 216. In case uh, we, you need a refresher on, on places, this is the thousand, right? That's why you say it's 1,000. This is the hundreds. This is the tens place. This is the ones place. Tenths. Hundreds. Hundreds. Thousands. All right, so um, so when I talk about precision, I'm saying, hey, which one is the least precise? Which one has the least amount over here on the right? Um, and that's why this was the answer over here. It only went to the tenths, whereas this one went to the ten thousandths place. All right, another example of where this can be quite confusing. This is in your book. I think I might even ask it. I'm looking right now. No, I don't ask it in the notes. So that's that's cool. That's good. Actually, it'll, let me do it right now. Okay. Is this. So let's say you have 4,200. And you want to subtract 22 from it. Okay. Well, when you go ahead and, and do this actual calculation... You're like, well, you can do kind of from right to left or left to right, or you can do it in your head. So what I'm going to do, you get 4,178. Now, this would be your answer if you're doing it on a calculator. But you're not. You're looking at measurements now, and you have to take into account the precision. So first you ask if you're multiplying or dividing or adding and subtracting. Because you're adding and subtracting, you're looking at precision. So when we take 4,200 and we subtract 22, we get this as our answer. Which one of these two numbers was the least precise? Well, this one we knew all the way to the ones place, right? But remember, this one, these zeros are not significant. We actually only knew it to the hundreds place. Which one's least precise? That dude right there. And that is why this answer can only go to the hundreds place. Follow me. If you have... $4,178, and you round it up to the nearest hundred, that is actually equal to 4,200. 4,200 minus 22 equals 4,200. Let's do another example before you get too scared about that one. If I have, let's see. Eight hundred seventy five, and I subtract twelve point one. Now, this is where you want to be really careful because. Um, chances are, if you uh, were taught math, you kind of might want to add a, a decimal and a zero and then do all that, but then you're actually adding a zero. So throw it in your calculator and make sure that you've got it, um, got it right, because if you start accidentally adding numbers, you can mess yourself up. All right, so this ends up being, what is that? No, I'm not going to do it in my calculator. 862.9, I think. And 
now we've got to look at precision. This one goes to the ones place. This one goes to the tenths place. Which one's the least precise? This one's least precise. Ones is to the left of the tenths. So this one's the more precise one. And that's why our answer can only go to the ones place. 862.9 would round up, because this number is greater than 5, to 863. So I wanted to do that rounding example with you before we go back over here and say, why did it round up? Again, if you've got $4,178, you have about 4,200 bucks in your account, right? The, the only way to, to round it to a hundreds is to round that up. Now, if this were less than a five, if this were say 4,112 or something like that, this would round to 4,100. So I wanna make sure you pay attention to that. The fact that the number next to the one that you're rounding is five or greater or five or less depends on what you're going to do with it. All righty. Let's do the next one. It says, answer the following with appropriate sig figs and put your final answer in scientific notation. So these you should be able to be doing on your own right now. Um, so you could even pause it and do it and then check with me and then check back later, which I suggest doing. But nevertheless, let's go ahead and do it. Okay, so the first one is 42.36 times 1.20. And I get an answer of 50.9. Three, two. But it says use appropriate sig figs and then put your final answer in scientific notation. So here's what we're going to do. When it's multiplication or division, you're going to put into scientific notation first, then round. If it's addition and subtraction, you're going to round See, I did rotation. round and then scientific notation. Like I said, I really don't like writing, just not. All right, so we did this first one. The next thing we say is, hey, was this multiplication and division? It was. So let's go ahead and first put this in scientific notation and then worry about rounding to the appropriate number of sig figs. So we'd move the decimal over one. This is 5.0832 times 10 to the 1. And now we have to look at um, uh, rounding. So this right here had four sig figs. This one had three. What's smaller, four or three? Three is hopefully smaller. You underline these first three. Ask if the number next to the underline is five or greater. That three is not greater than five, and therefore you can, can just truncate it. Our answer is 5.08 times 10 to the 1. We're done. Let's move on to the next one. 1.57 minus 1.2. This will give us an answer of 0 0.37. But we subtracted, so we want to first round and then put our answer in scientific notation. Okay, um, how do we round? Well, we look for the least precise number. This one goes to the hundredths place. This one only goes to the tenths place. We want to do our answer, therefore, to the tenths. So I'm going to underline up to the tenths place. I'm going to ask if the number next to it is 5 or greater. It is, so I've got to round up. In other words, I'm going to say 0 0.4. That is technically my answer. But I asked you to put it in scientific notation. My answer in scientific notation would be 4 times 10 to the negative 1, because I'd have to move the decimal place one spot. Moving on to the next one. We have 1,500 times 2.0. This would give me an answer of 3,000. I want to first put that in scientific notation and then worry about rounding. This right here had three sig figs, or excuse me, this right there has two sig figs. That one has two sig figs. So how many should this have? Two. So you actually have to add 
a zero. Your calculator won't do that for you if you use scientific notation, for example. So make sure you're paying attention. Again, this one had two, that had two, therefore this answer had two. 3.0 times 10 to the third would be your answer. All right, now we get to 1,500 minus two. If you got 1,500 bucks in your bank account and you lose two dollars, well, that stinks, but you also still have about 1,500 bucks in your bank account, right? And that kind of helps us understand why the answer is what it's going to be. Here we have 1,500, we subtract two. Um, that gives us 1,498. Now, again, with adding and subtracting, you want to round first and then put in scientific notation. So let's go ahead and round this. This answer, we knew only to the hundred spot. That's going to be your least precise number because this one we knew to the tenths. If our least precise is the hundreds, we underline up to the hundreds. Ask if the number next to it is five or greater. It is, so we got to round up. This rounds to 1500. Now we put that into scientific notation, that will become 1.5 times 10 to the third. One, two, three. Last but not least, we have 1500 minus 5. 1,500, <clears throat> uh, I don't really like this question, I don't see the point of this question, but we're going to do it. 1,500 minus 5 gives you 1,495. This one, again, we knew to the hundreds place. This one we knew to the ones. Our answer, we should only know to the hundreds place. When you add or subtract, you round and then put it in scientific notation. So we need to round it to the hundreds place, which is right here. Underline up to it. Ask if the number next to it's five or greater. It is, so you gotta round up. 14.95 would round up to 15, for example. And that's why this is 1500. Now I'm gonna take a sidestep, because although I, I wasn't a particular fan of this problem, who wrote that? It was me. Um, there is a problem that I want to go over that's in your book. So let's say we've got 200 and we subtract 18. This one we know to the hundreds. This one we know to the ones. Which one's least precise? This one. So if we were to do this, we'd get, what is that, 182? So our answer would be 182 in a calculator, but we know that we have to follow significant figure rules. And that tells us that this answer has to go to the hundreds. So you underline up to the hundreds, ask if this number is five or greater. It's, it is, so we have to round up. What's 182 round up to to be the nearest hundred? 200, and that would be your answer. Now the problem in your book is this, 100 minus 18. It's the number one question I get. But 100 minus 18 is 82. We know that this one goes to the hundreds, and this one goes to the ones, and this one's our least precise. So we need our answer to go to the hundreds. So you underline the hundreds place. There is no hundreds place, right? There's a zero there, really, and you could do that. You could put a zero if it helps you. We underline to the hundreds place, and we ask if the number next to it is five or greater. It is, so we have to round up. What is 82 round up to to be to the nearest hundred? It rounds up to 100. If you got 82 bucks, you're pretty close to having 100 bucks. And that's why this is your answer in your book. All right, multiple step processes. Let's do this. Okay, so now that you've got a good, strong foundation on multiplication and division and addition and subtraction, and if you don't, I really suggest you pause and practice, 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 and, and do this lecture another day, because this is where it puts it all together and really makes sure that you understand what's going on. Let's go ahead and do it. We have 47.20 times 18. 
So you follow PEMDAS rules. You do what you normally do, but you keep check every single time. So here I get eight point, oh, I got scientific notation, sorry. 849.6 as my answer of this times this. But every time you do a step, every step you take, you want to um, track sig figs or precision. Depending on what step you just did. We just multiplied and divided. So what do you do? If you multiply divide, you look for the least sig figs. This one had four, this one had three, so this answer should technically have three. I'm gonna keep this six there. It's our best guess, but instead I'm gonna underline all the way up through the decimal. It's kind of important that you keep in mind that you're, uh, you're underlining the decimal. One, two, three. To which, now I'm gonna add 1.4673. And I get an answer of 851. I should have, could have done this, but 0 0.0673. So when you add, though, you look at precision, right? But you're not looking at the precision right here. You're looking at the precision that you underlined. You knew this one up to the ones, only the ones. You knew this one to the ten thousandths. Which one do you know the least about? This one. This is gonna be determining your precision. You only knew it to the ones place. Again, you kept the six for fun. Kept for fun. It's actually for a very important reason. It's your, again, it's your best guess, but this is the one that determined, the underline determined. And that is why you underline up to the ones place and you ask if these numbers, this number next to it is five or greater. It is not, so you truncate it. Your answer is 851, which would be 8.51 times 10 to the two in scientific notation. If you didn't get that, watch it again. Pause and watch it again, because it's really important that you understand where this underline came from and that you're following me and, and thinking through things as you're doing it. Why did you underline it? What was the point of that? How did you determine that you only underlined this one to the ones, etc.? Our questions, those are questions you should be asking yourself. All right, now we move on to this one. Again, we're following PEMDAS. So we're gonna take that 18.0 and we're gonna to add to it 1.4673 first. We get 3764.91, we get 19.4673. But we added. So every time you do an operation, you gotta pay attention to what you're doing. So we add it, so we're looking for the least precise thing. That would be this one. It went only to the ones place, or excuse me, only the tenths place. This one went to the ten thousandths. So I underline up to the tenths place. Now you're going to take that number and multiply it by forty-seven point two zero. So nineteen point. And when I do that, I get an answer of nine point one. Oops, I'm putting in scientific notation already. 9918.85656. But you multiply and divide, you look at sig figs. So how many sig figs did this one have? Don't be tempted to say it had how all these. It only had what was underlined, this one, this one, and this one. Those are the only ones you were sure about and the only ones that you knew. This had three sig figs. Even though you used those, this only determined that you had three sig figs. Times something with four would give you something with three, right? First, put this in scientific notation. 9.188. Five six five six. Whoa. Times ten to the two. Then you look at sig figs. This had three. This had four. You should underline the first three. Ask if the number next to it is five or greater. It is. So you round up. Nine point one nine times ten to the two is your final answer. All right, y'all. This should give you a good start. Don't forget to read chapter one 
and um, rewind, watch again. Don't hesitate to reach out. Office hours start next week, not this week, and I will see you all maybe someday soon. Bye.